25th anniversary of the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination and Platform for Action and the 20th anniversary of 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. Well, and psychological integrity. Secondly, promoting economic and social rights. And thirdly, strengthening the arts of women's voice and rural women, which are also empowered. This um, open air prison where hundreds and thousands of Indian troops are there, where um, people, the Kashmiris are uh, being, uh, you know, there's an occupation structure that is being uh, put into place. Um, and, and I mean, there's total and utter disruption of. Uh, of their normal lives, uh, they are under occupation, torture, children have been picked up, 10,000 children and uh, you know all of that that we read, that we pick up is coming from either the international press and I must say uh, um, that Indian press has also come out and is reporting about it or in some of the most, uh, um, most descriptive detailed reports on the way the state is torturing the Kashmiris at this point is coming from the Indians, so we must commend the Indians for that. Um, I invite our guests, let me just mention that the organizers of this conference tried very hard because they strongly believe that Kashmiri voices from Indian occupied Kashmir or people from Indian occupied Kashmir living elsewhere should be um, invited to speak whether over Skype or so on should address this conference but unfortunately um, um, Muniza was telling me that they approached at least around 50 people uh, 50 Kashmiris or uh, the answer was the same from everybody that if we get involved in any way we talk publicly about what is happening in Pakistan in our on what is happening in Indian occupied Kashmir so uh, we have to face then retribution uh, now you will keep this in mind that it has been taken away from 12 to 16 years old and if the Indian um, if JNK police is asked they are saying on record that we have imprisoned these kids age 12 and above because they are involved in stone throwing so this is the case and therefore uh, unfortunately we have not uh, been able to get any um, Kashmiri voices from Srinagar directly but Yakinan who is our panel I am sure that they will address the issues they are all very worst so let me start by um, inviting uh, the Prime Minister of Azad Jammu and Kashmir Raja Farooq Haider Khan Saab Aye, Raja Sir. Aye. Uh, Raja Sir will be the keynote speaker in need, and I requested him that we will uh, want him to speak at the end so that he can. Aye, Raja Sir, please sit back here. That Raja Sir can address some of the issues that are being raised. Um, then I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Hina Rabani Khad, who needs no introduction. She's a mem former foreign minister of Pakistan. A uh, member of the National Assembly, People's Party leader. Then we have uh, Mr. Rafiq Dar, Chief Spokesperson of Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front, Special Representative of Yasin Malik. And uh, Yasin Malik, ke liye to, uh, we have to be praying for him all the time because he is, as you know, um, he is in, in really bad shape. He is in imprisonment for months now. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Tariq Makash, senior journalist, um, he is based in AJK and uh, his reports we are reading all the time and he is the one giving us Agya Gupaji. And uh, last but not least, the one person who has really uh, written with great uh, passion, dedication and consistently on Kashmir, Ms. Victoria Schofield. <laughs> What then can be done to make sure that in Salah Rasul Kareem, Mama Baad, Fazlullah Min Shaitan Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. First of all, there is a communication blackout in occupied Kashmir. Very honoured and privileged to be um, in Pakistan again. Uh, I'm often welcomed and asked, "Is this your first visit?" And um, the hospitality within the question is always evident. 
um, that people want to show me around and make sure I enjoy my stay. I always feel embarrassed when I have to say, no, I've been here many times, um, but I still enjoy the hospitality. I'm particularly moved to be speaking um, at the Asma Jahangir conference. I first met Asma in 1989, and um, I, went to, I was working for the BBC at the time, and I went to interview her on the role of women in Pakistan. Pakistan has come a long way since that first interview. I also asked her to write a chapter for me um, for a book I was editing on Pakistan's 50th anniversary, 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. And um, of course I asked her to write on human rights and she looked at me um, quite, quite fearsomely and said, well of course I'll do that, but you know my chapter title will be Women's Rights. Women's Rights are Human Rights. Um, and that was asthma. Um, thank you to Suleyma and Munise for inviting me and to all the organizers and indeed to everybody, Prime Minister, Excellencies and Honourable Guests. I am going to talk about Kashmir because Kashmir is close to my heart. I first visited Kashmir in 1981, the Valley of Kashmir, and I saw its beauty. Uh, as we know, beauty doesn't necessarily bring peace and I want to read to you just very quickly an excerpt from what I wrote after my last visit, which was in May this year. Because, oops, just technical here. Mustn't lose my minutes. Shortly before 4 a.m., a chorus of voices erupted across Dal Lake from the mosques of Srinagar, signaling the beginning of prayer time for those observing Ramadan, they would already have had their only meal of the day until the sun set and they could break the fast at iftar. It is a tradition which is immutable throughout the Muslim world. But in the Valley of Kashmir on this glistening May morning, the chanting seemed especially beautiful. As the sun rose and the sky began to lighten over the ring of mountains dusted by snow, each refrain was echoed a few minutes later by a nearby mosque. It seemed as though the whole valley was singing. I had returned to Kashmir after nearly a decade. There were noticeable differences, with numerous recently constructed houses and a new flyover to improve Srinagar's congested traffic, but much was unchanged. The valley's magnificence, the sprawling town encircling Dal Lake, the bounteous flowers and waterfalls in the Nishat and Shalimar gardens, and the quantities of stray dogs feasting on the uncollected rubbish. But above all, there remains a sense of despair that the political life of the valley's eight million inhabitants will ever change. I wrote this before August 5th, and I think what we've seen since August 5th has really changed the narrative yet again. I spoke at a panel in the House of Commons shortly before coming, and one of the other speakers, and I pay tribute to her because it was her idea, not mine, described it as though previously with Jammu and Kashmir issue, you've had it like a chessboard, and various pieces kept moving around. She said, now the chessboard has been totally thrown away, and we're starting the game all over again. One of the casualties of an unresolved dispute is militarization. And one of the char uh, characteristics of militarization is human rights abuses. I don't need to repeat all the statistics which you already know regarding torture, rape, disappearances, half-widows, orphans. Because one rape, one orphan, one half-widow is too many in, in a conflict zone. Asma would, of course, have said this, and so I'm really repeating her notions, that without the rule of law, and I was powerfully moved by Baroness Helena Kennedy this morning, uh, talking about the rule of law. Without the rule of law, you cannot have a just system, and you cannot have democracy. And I think what I found profoundly from my visit just recently was the hopelessness of people who are trying to exist in a society where you don't have the rule of law. One young man came to see me and he was riding a motorbike and he said, I'm really sorry, I've come with my friend. 
he was about 23 years old, he had a small beard, and um, I said, that's fine, bring your friend, let's all talk. And he explained, I needed to come with a friend because I've come to see you today on my motorbike, but I don't know if tomorrow, when I ride my motorbike on my own, I'll be picked up and charged as being a militant. This is the sort of fear that people live under. And I think for both the young men and the young women, the women suffer, but so do the young men. Because what I think is particularly evident, and I say this as someone coming from the West, where we have the privilege of going to school, we know that we're going to be able to return from school, uh, we're going to be able to take our exams on time, we know we'd have to study. But the difficulty of trying to study um, when you're not quite sure if your school is going to be shut, whether there's going to be a curfew. I met a maths teacher. She was teaching maths at the University of Pawama. Well, you can imagine, uh, she was telling me, how can you get through a curriculum? Because they have curriculums just like us when the school is on, when the university is on shutdown. They have to try and persuade the children to study during their holiday period. All of these difficulties of just existence, we all take for granted, especially in the West, because we, we can do it so freely. Am I right for that? Yeah. My time is up. So I just wanted to give you a flavor, and of course there's so much more to say, and I do hope we'll have time for question time, about living in a, in a tragedy and how important it is for resolution. And the question, what can Pakistan do? Pakistan must lobby the international community. I know there's often a hopelessness that the international community doesn't care. I'm a member of the international community, and I care. And there are others like me. So please lobby the international community, because until there is resolution, there will continue to be human rights abuses. And we know what that resolution is in terms of the dispute between India and Pakistan. You know the history. But without resolution, you'll continue to have human rights abuses. Thank you so much. I'm going to try with the time that, it, that is at our command. I'm going to try and take you through three quotations, each from a non-Pakistani, and then uh, try and address the question that Naseem put to us uh, as to what can be a deterrence and what can Pakistan do about it. So we start with Prime Minister Nehru, who said in 1952, Kashmir is not the property of India or Pakistan. It belongs to the Kashmiri people. When Kashmir acceded to India, we made it clear to the leaders of the Kashmiri people that we would ultimately abide by the verdict of their plebiscite. If they tell us to walk out, I would have no hesitation in quitting Kashmir. We have taken the issue to the United Nations, and it is, as you remember, India which took the issue to the United Nations and not Pakistan and given our word of honor for a peaceful solution. As a great nation, we cannot go back on it. We have left the question of final solution to the people of Kashmir and we are determined to abide by the decision. So we are to assume that Modi's India is no more a great nation which decides to abide by the commitments, not just this one to the UNSC, but many, which I would hopefully try and take you through. Uh, and India is no more a great nation, conclusion of this particular quote. Now, then we have Mehbooba Mufti, who we know was part of even Modi government uh, as a coalition partner, who said the abrogation of Article 370 hasn't just made accession null and void, but also reduces India to an occupation force in Jammu and Kashmir. And then said, what an utter betrayal. And then we have a crying Sheikh Farooq Abdullah, who tells after three times the Interior Minister of India says in the assembly that he has not been arrested a crime, Farooq Abdullah comes and says this is a black day for anyone who believed in Indian constitution. So we are talking about legal, rule of law, just um, and you know system or the legal basis. And so this puts it into context as to where we are right now. And then lastly, my last quotation from uh, Amy Raja, who was member of the fact-finding mission, which found many children having been taken in prison by the Indian forces, who said, what I felt is happening in Kashmir is the Indian variant of genocide. There is a human tragedy, and that tragedy is because, so ma because of so many reasons. And of course, any one of us who's seen the fact-finding mission report knows what it says. Now, she talks about a deterrent, okay? I want to just say, we have to contextualize as to which world are we living in, okay? So post-19, you know, post-World War II, the world came with a world order to be able to ensure that conflict 
did not happen peace largely prevailed people largely had access to the civil human rights and states basically westphalian and beyond were able to function to deliver to the lowest common denominator the people of that particular state within its territorial boundaries the state we are in today the affair of the world or the world order as it exists unfortunately does not support any type of deterrence because what is deterrence if you commit a murder today you need to have a state and you need to feel that you will be implicated you will be imprisoned and then you will perhaps there will be a deterrent for you not to do it when you know that states can become rogue and get away with murder literally in broad daylight as has been explained uh then what is the deterrent as far as the international world is concerned as far as the world order is concerned now today what we see is that india under prime minister modi has literally become a rogue state and has it become rogue state only on the unsc resolutions i would argue no i would argue that prime minister modi's india has become a rogue state to its own supreme court orders to its own state high court orders to its own state legislation to its own constitution forget the people of kashmir occupied kashmir so when a state decides to go rogue and there's no deterrent of world order what do you do who do you go to where do you raise your voice and where do the poor kashmiri people raise their voice and then of course as we say you know i think our religion teaches us to do it peacefully never to lose hope and continue on the path of right and hopefully eventually this you know will be a passing phase i hope for the world order because unfortunately i would not really want my 11 year old uh, 9 year old and 6 year old to be growing in a world which is frankly speaking looking to be much more unpeaceful than the one that i was born into and mine wasn't that great either so as far as what are the options with pakistan they think eventually pakistan's best possible option is to continue on the path of moral high ground if we lose that and i know there have been lots of discussion on mistakes that we made in the past i don't want to be backward looking i want to be forward looking we must not you lose the moral high ground we must preserve it and that uh, affords us opportunity to serve the kashmiri people more than anything else we must associate ourselves and lobby and engage with the un bodies and all human rights bodies and the genocide watch etc etc there was talk about international attention and lobbying with international world and i will absolutely uh, go with what nasim said in my experience yes the human rights bodies yes some um, international media has been very very forthcoming frankly speaking uh, surprisingly so but look at the bilateral statements which have come out of every country barring three perhaps china for reasons that we all know malaysia turkey and iran barring that look at the bilateral statements which reflect the state of the world order i would imagine a world 20 years from today where such human rights abuse would not be able to get away with by any state be it the united states of america today frankly speaking because of their economic power and because of the space and place that they have in the world literally states are being given the message you can become rogue and there's no one to deter you then what else can pakistan do i think pakistan for us the biggest challenge is internal cohesion and ensuring that there is an absolute internal demonstration within the polity of this country to be doing everything that is right and correct when we point fingers at others we must make sure that our human rights record our freedom of press the way we treat our people is looking at least going in the on, on the right trajectory i understand we are a third world country and have many challenges but the democratic institutions must be preserve people's ability to voice opinion that may not be very happy who sound may not be very happy to our ears must we must demonstrate that when we propose something for others we are ensuring that we are demonstrating it within ourselves i also believe and i also believe and even before the scene is going to give me the note i shall end uh, that uh, i also believe that it's extremely important uh, that we understand there's a difference between creating noise and achieving something so i think creating a lot of noise by speeches etc for domestic consumption i think we should stop wasting our energy on that because every pakistani is convinced of the importance i think we need to really preserve and ensure that our energies are used in the right direction the world may not be fully attendant 
but I can assure you to the extent that India is going today. And I, I just want to end by saying uh, the last sort of mini uh, minute that today, to make no mistake, Modi's India today, Modi is benefiting from the reputation that India gained from prime ministers such as Nehru all the way to Vajpayee and Manmohan Singh and beyond. That is the India that Man, uh, Modi is currently enjoying the benefit of reigning. Modi's India's reputation will be lived through 10 years from today. And then we will see a discredited, disreputed, rogue India being recognized by the world. So therefore, we must continue with our efforts and ensure that there, no, uh, there is complete cohesion in what we say and how we practice it within Pakistan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. I have a little bit of a the of a لیکن میرے دوستوں نے مجھ سے کہا کہ تم اردو میں بات کرو تو مناسبت تاکہ آپ لوگوں کو میں جنجوڑ سکوں مناری بات تو یہ ہے تو سب سے پہلے آئی مس منیزی جانگیر دوستوں ممبر ورف سے پاکستان بار کاؤنسل نسیم درہ صاحب جنرل سن آتھر مس وکٹوریا سکوفیلڈ آئی میٹ ہر فرس ٹائم ان نائنٹی نائنٹی فور ان لندر لانگ ویسی دار کی مسئلہ آپ Hinnad Bani Khar Sahib, ex-Minister of State for Foreign Affairs and a member of the National Assembly. Mahmud Rafiq Dar Sahib, Chief Spokesperson of the Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front. Mr. Tarish Nikar Sahib, a renowned journalist of Dawn Daily in Zafrabad. Thoda sa mein ek wajit pal dhundu, phir mein apni baat dhundu mein garunga. Let me take this opportunity to extend my deep congratulations to Asma Jangir Foundation for organizing this movement in Kashmir. Asma Jangir has always been a passionate advocate of human rights, justice and freedom. She would consistently speak in favor of the oppressed people of Kashmir. Her contributions uphold the ethos of freedom, justice would always be remembered. I am very proud of you, Mr. Jangir, and I am very proud of you, Mr. Jangir. جو میرے خیال میں جو سب سے بڑا ٹریبیوٹ آپ کی امی کو دیا جا سکتا ہے سوشل میڈیا پر میں خود لکھنے والا تھا تو آگیا کہ اکیس کروڑ پر وائد مرد یعنی یہ میں کہ وہ اس طرح جنڈر کی نہیں کر رہا میں لیکن وہ ہمارے آؤٹا مردوں کو اتنا کمپلیمنٹ نہ دیا مجھے خطا تھا یہ بات آئے گی لیکن اس وجہ سے نہیں کہہ رہا وہ اس وقت کے حالات میں یہ آیا تھا جی 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 بزار شاپ سے کرنا جاتا ہوں گی کہ آج سیونٹی سکس ڈے ہے کشمیر کے اندر اور بہت سے بھی میں نے اسلام آباد میں یہ بات کہی تھی ایک بر کے بلا کوند گئی سارے چمن پر تو خوش کہ میری شاکر نے شیمہ نہیں جلیے یہ میں نے ہی فیس کرنا آپ نے نہیں کرنا مجھ سے تو بزخر آباد سے لائن اپ کنٹرول چالیس میل آپ سے سترہ میل دور ہے خیار رکھے اس بات کا بخدا میں آپ کو کہتا ہوں نہیں چھوڑا جائے ہندوستان آپ کو جو مرد ہی کرنے آپ یہ جو کرے سمینار اپنے مرکل کرنے بیٹھے کچھ رہے ڈالر کمائیں گنے بلنے اتنے آج ہو گیا اتنے ہو گیا اتنے آگے اتنے چلے گیا سٹاک کر سے نیچے چلا گیا اوپر چلا گیا آپ کو نہیں چھوڑے گا میں نے اس سے بھی یہ بات کہی تھی کہ وہ پانی کے معاملے میں اس نے کیا بک تقریر کی ہے آپ کے ساتھ یہ حریانہ میں مودی نے کہ میں پانی رکھوں گا تمہارا بات یہ ہے کہ میں اب کیا بولے آپ بھی مطلب ہے دل دکھتا ہے وہ فیض کہا نا کہ تیرے ہونٹوں کی پھولوں کی چاہت میں ہم دار کی خوش کی ٹہنی پہ بارے گے ہم جو تاریخ رہوں ہیں بارے گے کہ آج کشمی کی تاریخ رہوں ہیں بارے گے کوئی پرسانے حل نہیں ہے اس کا نہیں دے رہنے بارے کوئی جس طرح ہونا چاہیے تھا انسان ہے ہیومن بینگ ہے میں ڈیوائیڈ فیملی کا ہوں میری ماں ادھر کے رہنے والی ہے میں آپ کو چھوٹے سے ایک بات بتانا چاہتا ہوں جب پہلی بس آئی اس میں میری ماں کا میری بیوی کا چچا ہے میری اس کے فادر اللہ کے فرس قزن تھے وہ وہاں رہ گئے مطلب کسی رہ کسی طریقے اپنے پھوپی کے پاس اور ان کے فادر اللہ جو ادھر کر رہنے بڑے تھے وہ آئے اور شخص سے پہلی بار زندگی میں چھوٹا تھا ڈیڑھ دو سال کا تو اپنے باپ کی قبر دیکھے اپنے گھر آیا ان کے میں نے مامو سر سے پوچھا آپ کیا کر رہے گئے تھے کہہ رہے گا میری شادی ہوئی یہ جو ہمارے ہوتا ہے مکلاوہ میں کیا جنگ لگ گئی تو ساٹھ سال کے بعد مکلاوہ ختم ہو اور میں اپنے گھر آئے ہوں سکسی ایئرز کے بعد یعنی میں آپ سے جو گزارش کرنا چاہتا ہوں جس حالات میں جس قرب میں کشمیری آج زندگی گزار رہے ہیں اس کا اب آدمی لکھتا ہے ساری باتیں کرتا ہے 
کہ جنہیں میں کنونشن کیا کہتا ہے یونیٹیڈ نیشنز کی مطلب ہے یہ جو ملٹیپل ریزولوشن یہ کیا کہتی ہیں وار کرائمز کے بارے میں کیا کہتے ہیں آرٹیکل فورٹی ٹو ہے ایک ریزولوشن کا وہ کیا کہتا ہے اسی طرح سے پھر جو میں آپ سے کہنا چاہتا ہوں کہ دو ہزار چھے کا جو ہے یہ انٹرنیشنل کنونشن فار پروٹیکشن آف آل پرسنز فرام انفورس ڈسپیرنس ٹوئنٹی دسمبر دو ہزار چھے کا آج غیر مفت کا اطلاعات تیس ہزار بتاتی ہیں کوئی چالیس ہزار بتا رہی ہیں کوئی تیرہ ہزار یا چودہ ہزار وہ بچے چھوٹے دس سال سے تیرہ چودہ پندرہ سال کے جو ان کو وہ پکڑ کے لے گے کوئی پتہ نہیں ہے کدھر ہے ماں کہتی ہے بیٹا رات کو سویا تھا بغیر کی میز کو اٹھا کے لے گے پتہ چلا ہے کہ وہ لکھ رہا ہوں ہے اب سرنگر سے لکھ رہا ہوں کتنا دور ہے آپ کو اندازہ کر سکتے ہیں اس ماں کے قرب کا آپ اندازہ ہے آپ پرمینہ آنگر کے قرب کا کر سکتے ہیں سولہ سال کا اس کا بیٹا تھا انہوں سے نوے میں غائب ہوا آئے تھے کہ اپنے بیٹے کو تلاش کر رہی ہوا یعنی جو کچھ کشمیر کے اندر ہوا شاید آپ اس کا اندازہ نہیں ہے آپ کو کہ کیا ہو رہا ہے اور کیا کرنا چاہتا ہے وہ مودی اپنے پلان کے مطابق ایک ایک سٹیپ جو ہے وہ کراف کرتا جا رہا ہے اب مجھ سے یہی والی بات ہے مجھ سے جب سب پوچھے پوچھتے ہیں مجھے اس سے پوچھا کشمیر what next آپ کل اگر انڈیا اٹھا لیتا ہے کہ انہوں میں اس کا یہ لفٹ کر لیتا ہے یہ کچھ کر لیتا ہے تو کیا کشمیر کا مسئلہ حالو جائے گا کیا فضول پتہ بھائی یہ حکومت پاکستان کا موقف ہے یہاں سے کہ جی وہ کرفی اٹھا لے یہ کر لے وہ اٹھا لے گا تو پھر کیا ہوگا اور رائٹ ایف یہ ہیومرائٹ ویلیشن کشمیر میں ہوتی رہیں گی انٹر نانلس کے ان کا فائنلی ڈسپلیشن نہیں ہو جاتی کشمیر کے مسئلے کی کشمیری کو رائے کی مطابق اب آپ مجھ سے نسیم دارا صاحب پوچھ لیں کیا اب یہ مربانی کار صاحب ہے مکہ رہی تھی میں آپ کو صاف واضح بتانا چاہتا ہوں جب تک آپ کشمیری فیس آگے نہیں رکھیں گے آپ کو کوئی پزیرائی نہیں ملے گی وہ کس لیے یہ مطربہ میری بہن نے کہا کہ ڈسپیوٹ بیٹوین انڈیا پاکستان اس نیٹے ڈسپیوٹ بیٹوین انڈیا پاکستان یہ کشمیر کا رائے جب سیٹر ڈیمنشن ہے پاکستان ہمارے موقف کا حامی ہے وہ تو ہمارے لائی گراؤن پر کھڑا ہے وہ نہیں آپ کو اگر آپ اس کو ڈسپیوٹ دیکھیں نا بات یہ ہے آپ لوگ بات جاتے ہیں ہندوستان کا جو بن گیا ہے جس طرح وہ خود کہہ رہی تھی کہ جوالہ نارو سے شروع اور اب وہ مودی کھا رہا ہے اس کا کیا ہوا جو ہندوستان کا بن گیا ہے دنیا کے دنیا تٹ اس کا اکانمی کا سائز دوسرا تیسرا وہ جب آپ اس کو پاکستان سے کمپیر کریں گے میرا بلک ہے پاکستان مجھے فقر ہے اپنے آپ پر لیکن جو گراؤنڈ ریلیٹیز ہیں اس سے وہ ہندوستان کی طرف جائیں گے وہ ٹیریٹوری ڈسپیوٹ بنتا ہے جب آپ کشمیری کو آگے کریں گے میں نہیں اپنے مقابلت کر سکتا میں اس قریشی صاحب سے میں کوئی مہم کوئی میں میں نہیں کر سکتا اپنی مقالت وہ ڈالکر خیصد روز بیان دیتا رہتا پتہ ہوتا ہے نہیں اس کو پرانے گسے پٹے انہوں نے پچھلے پچاس سال سے لکھے ہوتے ڈیٹے چینج کرتے رہتے وہ دے دیتے ہیں اس کو کیا میں نہیں کر سکتا اپنی بات کیوں نہیں کر سکتا میں اپنی بات بات یہ کہ آپ کو ریلیٹیز کے مطابق تبدیلی لانی پڑے گی اگر یہ کچھ کرنا ہے نہیں کرنا ہے تو مجھ سے آپ نے پوچھا تھا بھی میں صاف کرنا چاہتا ہوں آپ کو میں نے ان سے کہا کہ اب نظرہ کا عالم ہے مجھ پر تم اپنی محبت واپس لو دوسرا شیر مجھے آتا نہیں ہے کمر جلال بھی کہا بس کریں بس چھوڑ دیں ہمیں میں جانوں میرا کام جانے میں آپ کو حلفن کہتا ہوں ہم نے اب نوز کرنے کے لیے میرے پاس رفیق ڈار کے پاس کچھ نہیں ہے دار نکاش کے پاس کچھ نہیں ہے یہ بھی رفیوجی ہے سری نگر کا وہ بھی وہاں سے آئے ہوئے اپنے اس کو میں آتا ہوں میری ماں سری نگر کے رہے میرے ماں کے باپ کے شہر ایلو سی کے ساتھ میں خود ایلو سی پر چکوٹی مرے کو کہا تین دفعہ مجھ پر انڈیٹ فرم میں نہیں مرا نا تو نہیں ہے موجب سے آئے گی تو آ جائے گی مجھے تو میں اوپری کیوں نہ لڑتا ہوا مارا جاؤں میں کلاس کرتا ہوا کیوں نہ مارا جاؤں میری رات میرے دوسرے لوگ اس میں فخر کر سکے بجائے میں بیٹ پر مروں میں کیوں مروں میں میں آپ کو یہ جذباتی باتیں نہیں کہہ رہا میں آپ سے بلہ ہم نے لوس کرنے کے لئے مارے پاس کچھ نہیں ہے آپ آئیدر آئیدر بی بی پیرش اور ویل فورس انڈیا آؤٹ آف سٹیٹ آف جمہور کشمیر کوئی دوسری بات نہیں مارے گی کچھ نہیں ہے لوس کرنے کے لئے ہمارے پاس اور پھر آپ ہمارے پاس ایک ٹیریٹری ہے ازاد جمہور کشمیر انگلوڈی گلگل پر دستان آپ کے پاس ایک علاقہ ہے آپ نے کوئی اگزائل گورنمنٹ نے اگزائل تو نہیں بنانی آپ نے آپ اس کو کہ کب آؤ گے ادھر سے مجھے کہتے ہیں کب جاؤ گے تم یعنی یہاں لوگ کہتے ہیں کب جاؤ گے وہ کہتے ہیں کب آؤ گے میں اس مخبص میں گرفتار ہوں کوئی مجھے بتاتا ہے فیٹ اف کو بتاتا ہے کہ آپ کو کہا آپ سے اس طرح آپ کو کوئی نہیں نکل لیں دے گا میری بات یاد رکھیں اور پھر بڑے خوش ہے میں نے لکھا کہ ہم گری لسٹ میں ہیں واجی 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 کیا کمارا ہمارا 
اس پر اس پر مطلب ہے یہ ڈھول بجایا جا رہے کہ جی ہم گرے لسٹ میں کیا مطلب ہے یہ کیا اس ملک کے ساتھ بزار کر رہے ہیں ایسے تو نہیں بنا یہ ملک پچپن ہزار مسلمان اڑتے ہوا ہوئی ہیں ایسا بشرقی پنجاب اور انڈیا میں جب پاکستان بنا تھا یہ ایسے نہیں بنا یہ یہ بڑی قربانی سے بنا یہ ملک کو خدا کا خوف کریں اب میں آپ سے جو عرض کرنا چاہتا ہوں کہ آج جمہو کشمیر نہ یہ اندوستان کا حصہ ہے نہ پاکستان کا حصہ ہے یہ پندرہ اگست انیس سو سنتالیس کی پوزیشن پر واپس چلا گیا اس لیے کہ پندرہ اگست کو کوئی معاہدہ ہری سنگھ نے نہیں کیا تھا کشمیر ان کے ساتھ جس بنیاد پر اسے معاہدہ کیا تھا اندوستان نے وہ شکی ختم کر دی اڑا دی وہ یوان کے ریولیشن سے ہی نکل گیا بار تو وہ فرمائیے نا کہ جس معاہدے کی بنیاد پر وہ اس کے لئے ایک ایگریمنٹ کیا تھا ایک پہلے پروویجنل تھا اس کا لاؤن بٹ مان بٹن نے پریس کنفرنس میں کہا اس کو میڈیا کو کہا کہ اس کا آخری فیصلہ کشمیری کرنے گا ابھی انہوں نے جوہلا نیرو کی بھی پڑی اس کے لئے اس کے بعد بھی باتیں آتی ہیں کرشنہ مینن بھی یہ کہتا رہا لیکن یہ ہے کہ اس سے بھی وہ مطلب ہے منرف ہو گیا جب فورٹی نائن میں جب مراجے نے دوبارہ لے کر دیا کہ تین سر درستی جب انڈیا کا کنسٹیوشن بن رہا تھا وہ اس کے چند شرائط تھی اس کے لیے آپ کسی کو مکان قرائے پر دیتے ہیں کوئی شرائط ہی دیتے ہیں نا اگر وہ مالک مکان قرائے اس پر نہ پترے تو آپ کہتے ہیں جاؤ بھائی نکلو ادھر سے باہر اس ہی نہیں سی بات ہے نا تو کہنے کا مقصد میرا یہ ہے کہ آج اس جگہ ہم واپس آ گئے ہیں اب یہ وقت ہے کہ ہمیں جو ہے اس وقت جو ہے میں آپ سرز کروں میرے نقتدر میں ہمیں مختلف جو آرٹیکلز ہیں یو این کے ہمیں اس کو بھی غور کر رہا چاہیے دیکھیں میں تو ہم تو کوشش کر گئی جو پروٹوکول ہے اس کا ایڈیشن جو ہے تو دی جنیوہ کنونشن آف ٹویلت اگست نائٹین فورٹی نائن ایڈ ریلیٹنگ تو دی پروٹیکشن آف ویٹنز آف انٹرنیشنل آرم کنفلیکس پروٹوکول ون آف ایڈ جو نائٹی سیونٹی سیون ہم اسی پر آری باتوں کو لگے ہوئے ہیں پر نئی بات نہیں کرو بھائی کوئی نئے ایونیوز دیکھیں آپ تراش کریں آپ آپ ہمارے وکیل ہیں ہمارا فیٹ ایک ہے تو اس لیے میں آپ سے گزارش کرنا چاہتا ہوں کہ مطلب ہے تو میں سچی بات آگتا ہوں حضرین میں بہت دکھی ہوں میں آپ سے سچ بتا ہوں کہ جس کشمیر کی مجھے پرسوں ایک کشمیری ملے اسلام آباد میں اس نے کہا فاروق صاحب جس کشمیر کی آج آپ بات کرتے ہیں جو میں ادھر سہل دس سال کے بعد یہ وہ کشمیر ہی نہیں ہوگا یہ اس کی ڈیموکرافی چینج ہوگی ہے کس کشمیر کو تم تلاش کرتے پھر ہوگے دیکھئے نائنٹین فورٹی سیون میں فورٹی ایٹ میں آج ایک متعدد دس سے لے کر پندرہ لاکھ تک ویس پاکستان کے ریفیجیوز کشمیر کے اندر ہے جمہو میں ان کے اندر ہے جو اسے تھرٹی فائی بے ختم کیا وہ بنایا تھا مراجہ حری سنگھ نے نائنٹین ٹوٹی سیون میں ہندوں کے خود کہنے پر ان کی پروٹیکشن کے لیے مسلمان کو کہنے پر نہیں بنایا تھا اب جب اس کو ختم کیا ان کو وہ دے گا کہنا میں اس کا وہ ریاست کے باشندے بن گئے پھر ہندوستان سے بھی لوگ آ رہے ہیں زمینیں خریدیں گے ساری بات کریں گے پھر نائنٹین دوہزار چھتیس تک جو ہے اس کی جو ڈی لیمیٹیشن بند کی تھی پچھلی حکومت نے اس کو میں وہ ختم کرے گا وہ جو سیاسی قیادت ہے جو پولیٹیکل لیڈرشپ ہے وہ ویلی سے اٹھا کے جنگو میں لانا چاہتا ہے ان کی آبادی بڑھائے گا وہ ہم دیکھ رہے ہیں جناب یہاں پر بیٹھے ہوئے مجھے بتایا کیا ہم نے کیا ابھی تک کوئی ایسا کام مجھے بتایا کہ جیسے کوئی ہندوستان کو جو ہے کوئی اس میں اس کو کوئی رکاوٹ پڑی ہو یہ اس طرح نہیں چلے گی یہ بات نہیں میں نے آپ سے کہا نہیں یہ تو چھوڑ دیں ہمیں چھوڑ جائے تو جانے میں جاؤ کچھ بھی ہو یہ مرضی کرنا کرو اپنا اب بہت ساری باتیں کہا بھی اپلی نہیں کر سکتا جو میرے ذہن میں کہ ہمیں کیا کرنا چاہیے ملکی سلامتی کے بھی معاملات ہوتے ہیں لیکن یہ کہ کب تک ہم اپنے دل میں دبا کے رکھیں گے مطلب میں سچی بات ہے میں جب الوسی پر کھڑا ہوں تو میری کانسٹیٹنسی ہے جب نظر پڑتی ہے سامنے آپ اگر پودر جائیں اس نیلے ملی میں چلیں آپ ان کو آوازیں بھی دیں گے وہ نہیں دیکھتے آپ کی طرف ان ٹرنوں کا سر نیچے رہتا ہے اوپر بیٹھا ہو رہا تھا آر وقت وہ انڈین سولجر یعنی اس سے ان کو یعنی میں نے اس سے انگلینڈ سے آیا تھا پوچھا میں نے اس سے کشمیری سے جو گیا تھا ادھر سری نگر تھا وہ اس سے میں نے پوچھا کیا ہے اس نے کہا آپ سمجھتے ہیں اس نے کہا کہ ہمیں زلط میں نے اس نے بھی کہا تھا اسلام باغ ہمیں زلط کے زلطی گزارنے پر مجبور کیا جائے کہ ہمارے سار جو جائے کہ ہمارا یہی فیٹ ہے بس آپ سمجھتے ہیں زلط کے زلطی کیا ہوتی ہے یعنی ہم تو نہیں دکھاتے پانچ چھ سال پہلے میں بار بار پیڈ کرتا ہوں بی بی سی پر ایک چلی اپنا یہ ایک چھوٹی سی وہ تھی تھا وہ کرپ تھا 
دس بارہ نوجوان لڑکے ان کو مادر زاد ننگا کر کے چلا رہے اس پر اور جب وہ اپنی سطر پوشی کرتے ہیں ان کو ماں بہن کی گالیاں نکالتے ہیں اس سے کیا ذلت ہوگی مجھے آپ بتائیے اگر لاہور کی سڑکوں میں چند لوگوں کو پریڈ کیا جائے ننگا کیا مطلب برے نہ کر کے کیا مطلب یہ ہے مطلب کیا اور اس سے زیادہ تزویز کیا کریں وہ لوگوں کی کشمیریوں کی نہ میری بیٹی کی عزت محفوظ ہے نہ میری ماں کی نہ میری بہن کی نہ اس کی پراپٹی محفوظ ہے نہ اس کی اولاد محفوظ ہے مطلب ہے وہ جو کشمیری کہتا ہے میں آپ کو پھر کہتا ہوں میں آپ کو کہتا ہوں واللہ میں آپ کو کہتا ہوں مجھے کوئی ڈر شار کسی کا بھی کرسی رہتے رہے نہیں جنگم میں جائے تو فکر میں بیسیکلی میرے اوپر ایک فرض آئید ہوتا ہے یہ جو کشمیر جس کو خون چاہیے ہمارا ہے یہ میرا ہے آپ اگر نہیں میرا حسن پر ساتھ دے سکتے نہ دیں آپ ساتھ ہم کریں گے اس کا اپنے فیصلہ خود کریں گے نہیں یہ باتی باتیں نہیں کہہ رہا واللہ میں آپ کو آنے والے وقت سے آگاہ کرتا ہوں بخدا میں آپ کو کہتا ہوں میں آنے والے وقت سے آگاہ کروں دیکھیں مودی کیسے چل رہا ہے وہ سٹیپ پائی سٹیپ چل رہا ہے وہ ہم ریاشن میں پالسی بناتے ہیں ایک آگ بیان دے دیا ویارت خاضہ کی طرف سے کوئی مجھے بتاتا ہے کلیڈر بتاتا ہے ہم نے تین سال میں یہ کرنا دو سال بارہ تو میں آخری بات آپ سے کرنا چاہتا ہوں بات میں کوئی کچھ پیسٹنز ہوں گے اس کا دعا ضرور دوں گا کہ آخری دو تین اشار سے اپنی گفتگو ختم کرتا ہوں روح کا زخم پرانا ہے مگر تالا ہے روح کا زخم پرانا ہے مگر تالا ہے یہی آشف تسری دے دی اسیری سے نجات سر سلامت ہے تو یہ دیوار پی دروازہ ہے یہ اپنے بھائی کے لیے کہہ رہا ہوں اڈھار کے لیے جو بیٹھا تھا توڑنے کے لیے کہ سر سلامت ہے تو دیوار پی دروازہ ہے انشاءاللہ زندہ رہے تو یہ توڑیں گے اس کو انشاءاللہ لذیر یہی آپ سے دیوارے کرنا چاہتا ہے ایک کمیٹی تو پروٹیکٹ جرنلیس اور ایک جرنلیس ہمسیلف ایک پیو دیز جس ریسنٹلی ہی وز ڈینائیڈ انٹری انٹو پاکستان ایون دو ہی ایڈا ویلیڈ ویزا and he was one of the proposed speakers for our conference today. The issue was highlighted in the press, both nationally and internationally. Our conference committee was concerned and we wish to carefully consider our response, which I will read here today on their behalf. Pakistan is known for its hospitality. We regret that Mr. Stephen Butler, an internationally acclaimed, from an internationally acclaimed organization, the Committee to Protect Journalists for the Defense of Freedom of Expression, was turned back when he arrived at Lahore Airport, armed with a valid visa. We do not think the authorities were legally within their rights to treat Mr. Butler in this manner. And the authorities must be aware of the adverse implications of denying him entry. We cannot but disapprove of this procedure in the strongest terms possible. The Asma Jangir Conference Committee believes that journalists must be allowed freedom to move to other countries in the world and meet fellow journalists and report on the state of freedom of expression anywhere. Denial of this right to any journalist will not go down to the credit of the state of Pakistan. I feel humbled and privileged that I am here to open this event first and foremost in my capacity as Asma's daughter and secondly, as one of the organizers of this event. As many of you here would know, my mother Asma was passionate about the cause of justice and the empowerment that comes with attaining true justice. It is for this reason that the legal community was a close family to her, a family that she cared about deeply and a family with whom she shared a common fate. They faced many challenges together in a country with a history riddled with dictatorships and times of oppression. She and her fellow lawyers fought many battles together for the rule of law. 
she was at the forefront of the lawyers movement from the time of general zia to the time of general musharraf and to the current time she stood here in awari many times hosting legal conferences but she stood outside the awari on the mall road even more times protesting against the abrogation of constitutional rights in 1983 her journey began it was her and other women's rights activists and not mainstream political parties who challenged the brutal dictatorship of general zia outside on the mall road they were beaten they were dragged by their hair into police vans and this was her first stint in prison but these women these courageous women they saw even opportunity in adversity while in prison she saw many other women prisoners often poor and ignorant who were hauled up in prison on discriminate because of discriminatory laws at the time of zina extramarital sex these were women who were being persecuted by their former husbands by their parents if they had married of their own will so she decided that while she is in prison she should be productive so she and her fellow lawyers started preparing bail applications for these women since then she and her team have given legal representation to thousands of women and child prisoners in pakistan her office continues to do this every year they help hundreds of women and child prisoners who are hauled up and usually are serving prison as under trial prisoners she was also one of the few lawyers who traveled regularly to marginalized areas such as balochistan parts of kpk interior sindh gilgit baltistan to express her solidarity with the legal community there to, in their hours of need throughout dictatorships and pseudo democracies she was one of the lone voices who demanded and insisted upon the restoration of constitutional rights and true democracy she was passionate upon about using the law as an instrument for positive change in a country where sadly lawlessness and inequality have become endemic and pervasive she and her team at agihs provided and continue to provide free legal aid to tens of thousands of vulnerable and marginalized people but it was not just about providing access to justice to the persecuted to the marginalized she was again at times the only lawyer who was willing to take up dangerous cases often at the expense of her own personal security cases such as honor killings blasphemy cases the right of an adult muslim woman to marry of her own free will bonded labor and in later years cases that rejected the influence of the military on pol in politics starting from cases of disappeared persons military courts the regulation and control over the media and memo gate to mention a few for this reason for her ability to speak truth to power and her honesty and integrity she gained respect within the legal community and despite many vilification campaigns and a very dirty media campaign she was elected as the first woman president of the supreme court bar association in 2010 she held a special place in her heart for the legal community in pakistan she believed that they were resilient 
that they were generous and that they believed in the rule of law often at the expense of their own personal safety and their livelihoods she believed that the legal community comprised the intellect and the conscience of our society they bore the responsibility and felt the responsibility for protecting our constitutional rights but that did not mean that she compromised her principles for taking popular stands or for political expediency she was the first one to criticize judicial overreach in the aftermath of the lawyers movement she was also heavily critical of the persecution of political opponents under the guise of the law i have often wondered what she would think or say if she was here now i am sure she would make a lot of noise and cause some pain in certain quarters i am sure that it would not be just the national um it would not be just the national state of affairs but also what is happening regionally that would worry her it seems unthinkable that just a few years ago she took a delegation of over 100 pakistani lawyers to india at the invitation of the indian bar association and then there was a reciprocal visit from india to pakistan but i do believe that she felt that there were very few opportunities for a legal community and for a human rights activist in pakistan to come together to exchange ideas honestly and openly i think we have been joined by one of the i would say iconic personality former president supreme court bar association and a very affectionate elder of asma jangir mr abad hasan manto thank you very much for joining us sir i also welcome ms malika bukhari the parliamentary secretary for law and justice in the national assembly thank you for coming mr senior puny judge justice gulzar ahmed supreme court of pakistan honorable presidium ladies and gentlemen his excellency abad manto sahab who has graced the occasion and come all the way being old friend of asma ladies and gentlemen it is an honor to be present here today and an absolute pleasure to be addressing a hall full of brilliant minds and a diverse audience ranging from honorable judges diplomats writers human rights activists policy makers students bar leaders politicians member parliament philanthropist trade unionist and all the other sectors of the society including civil society and to the diligent young generation who are builders of tomorrow gathered here from all corners of the world in the memory of asma jangir today i would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone in attendance this would have not possible without the tremendous efforts of an extremely hard working team of ags human rights cell nida alia munize jahangir Salema Jahangir and all other team members 
with the patron age of Janab Tahir Jangir and I can go on for hours talking about asthma, her courage, boldness, humility. The list is infinite because what she was cannot be summed up in words. She was merely an 18 years old when she began her struggle for democracy, justice and human rights in 1972. It takes a special person to challenge an entire political system based on dictatorship at such a young age and Asma was exactly that and much more. This beginning of her career represents the core of Asma's legacy. Resistance, persistence and resilience in the face of obstacles along the way. Asma became the voice of women in Pakistan, ensuring that access to justice was proportionate and preferably larger to the ratio of crimes committed against women in Pakistan. Our struggle to highlight the need of developing a separate code for dealing with juvenile crimes was a service to both to the efficiency of judicial system and humanity as a whole. She was an exception among the lawyers and activists that I had met in my career who never differentiated victims on the basis of caste and creed and religion and in fact pushed all boundaries to protect systematically disadvantages in Pakistan across the globe. In a profession largely dominated by men, Asma stood firm in her resolve to alter the discourse and was elected as the first female president of Supreme Court Bar Association in 2010. Access to justice and freedom for all we are all living time in times where asthma is in turmoil, where freedom of media is facing bounds like, like, like never before. Act acts of extremism, but it is, but be it the bombing of a mosque in New Zealand, the persecution of minority, there are all pressing indicators for a change in strategy and a renewed commitment to every and debate, reforms and analysis and most importantly resolve. Given the diversity that are imperative to a more progressive, enlightened and aware society. Thank you very much, Munize. Again, thanks. Thank you, Bhun Saab. Thank you very much. I'm invited to this conference and to be asked to address you all. Uh, this is a very fitting tribute to the memory of the late, great, and incomparable Asma Jahangir and the valuable legacy that she bequeathed to us all. I was uh, very privileged to have been a part of a set of chambers in London that made Asma an honorary tenant back in 2000. Uh, this conference could not have uh, come, I believe, at a more essential or relevant time, a time when the rule of law and the protection of fundamental freedoms are under pressure all around the world. We in the UK have a bilateral protocol with Pakistan in relation to international child abduction and we really value uh, that judicial cooperation between our jurisdictions. Uh, that protects children uh, who have been removed or retained in either country, in either direction, 
uh, in a circumstance uh, which might amount to a wrongful interference with the other parents and the children's rights and interests, and it protects that. The rationale behind it, you will appreciate, is that decisions concerning uh, children should be determined in their state of habitual residence. It is very difficult, if not impossible, for the left-behind parent to participate effectively in either jurisdiction or at all. That brings me to the fundamental importance of a robust legislative framework to plug the gaps and deficits and to uh, offer these for all of our citizens. And that must be done, it seems to me, in consultation with experts, academics, uh, Protection Act of 90, 2007, which has provided a highly effective remedy for hundreds of victims of forced marriage, to permit a free and independent press to scrutinise those laws. Those Mr. Justice Kulzar Ahmed, Senior Puny Judge, Supreme Court of Pakistan, honourable dignitaries on the Presidium, ladies and gentlemen, I am thankful to all of you honouring us and uh, participating in the conference. Aristotle famously said that you will never do anything in this world without courage. It is the greatest quality of the mind next to honour. Today we all are here to pay tributes to a one of the most courageous lady of the world have ever seen. She once said, there have been times that I have cried, but does that mean you give up in the face of the brute force? No, never. She is known for her outspoken nature and relentless quest for human rights as well as remaining fearless in the face of extreme pressure and opposition. She always challenged conservative social norms and fought for disempowered and against those who were trying to mold society into authoritarian society. Ahmad Rashid, her friend rightly said that if you take the breath of causes, she spotted, it was more than any normal woman could undertake. Her greatest cause was her vision of liberal democratic Pakistan. As a part of her mission, she set up a liar group for the independence of judiciary, supremacy of the constitution and rule of law. Cases of women rights, blasphemy, forced disappearance she pursued were not just legal cases. These were movements that she helped galvanize. I consider myself lucky that I got a chance to work under her leadership, in which I learned how to stick by the ideas of freedom and social justice. It is crucial time when democracy and independence of judiciary is facing grave challenges, legal fraternity and civil society is feeling her absence as different sections of the society are raising serious questions on the ongoing process of accountability therefore it is important that the supreme court should take its responsibility to safeguard and protect the right to life of the people which is important to maintain peace and stability in the society.
At the end, I am feeling honored to mention that contribution of my mentor will go down in the history of Pakistan. Thank you very much. Judges, respected bar uh, members, Excellency Member State Ambassadors, Ambassadors from other countries and other UN organizations, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. It is an absolute honor and a pleasure to be here representing the European Union and to be a partner in this conference. And I would like also on our behalf to welcome everybody to the second edition of the Asma Jahangir Conference. As I look around this uh, very impressive hall and the attendance of this hall, it is quite clear that the Asma Jahangir, Asma Jahangir has left a powerful and lasting legacy in Pakistan. And not just only here, but also to the wider South Asia region through her contributions to the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan, the Women's Action Forum, the Supreme Court Bar Association of Pakistan, and many other initiatives. Let me just say that I personally am very much regret that I have not had the opportunity to end the honor, end the honor to meet her. I, I am, however, glad that I've met her very impressive daughters and other members of her family. Asma Jahangir was a recipient of several European awards for her unwavering work in speaking truth to power and promoting and defending the notion of justice for all. She was also a special re rapporteur of the United Nations on freedom of religion. Let me say that in these troubled times, when human rights globally are under attack and there are many forces using toxic methods messages and toxic narratives to spread fear and division. Those like her who dare to make, take stand against injustice and to defend human rights need not only to be defended but also to be celebrated and remembered. This is what this conference is about. This is why we're supporting this conference. Two striking features of Asma Jahangir's struggle for justice was first, her commitment to advancing women's rights as human rights, and secondly, advancing rule of law and the independence of the judiciary. Advancing human rights and the rule of law are also two priority areas at the heart of both what the European Union is doing internally and in its foreign policy. On the first priority of advancing human rights, we welcome the decision to have a focused discussion on, on girls and women human rights at the conference. This discussion could not be more timely as it heralds the series of milestone anniversaries on gender equality and girls and human rights um, issues, namely, the 40th anniversary of the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, and the 20th anniversary of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. Next year also, the 2030 Agenda will turn five years old, which strengthens the de facto accountability for gender equality commitments at all levels. These were and are among the fundamental pillars inspiring and re informing UN po EU policies and actions in all we do. To underline the importance of gender equality in our relations with other countries, the EU and its member states has adopted a gender action plan. This has three pillars of action. The first is ensuring girls and women physical and psychological integrity. Secondly, promoting economic and social rights. And thirdly, strengthening girls and women's voice and participation. In Pakistan, we use and apply those three pillars in what we do. And gender equality lies at the heart of EU development cooperation programs. I'll just give you a couple of examples. 
uh, we work in our program promotion of human rights closely with the Ministry of Human Rights and the independent commissions both at federal and provisional level to strengthen the institutional capacities to protect and promote human rights and to raise awareness. Our flagship program on women's economic empowerment in SINT, which is a community-based economic strengthening uh, support program, targets about 800,000 households and basically aims at poverty uh, reduction. The beneficiaries are women, they are rural women, which are also empowered to, uh, not only empowered economically, but are also making leadership roles in their communities. On the second priority of the conference relating to uh, support of rural law, let me f say first of all that rule of law and equal access to justice for everybody is enshrined in the Treaty of the European Union, and it's one of the fundamental values of the European Union. As in the audience, there is a, high, a large percentage of legal professionals. I would like to refer to Article 2 of the Treaty of the European Union, which states that, and I quote, the EU is founded on the values of respect of human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including rights of persons belonging to minorities. The rule of law and human rights is also one of the uh, priorities of our cooperation and our development programs with Pakistan. We have defined priorities which include the increase of dialogue and cooperation between the role, uh, rule of law actors to promote digitalization and efficiency of service delivery and to increase access uh, to justice with a special focus on women. All of these issues are very closely linked with the theme of this conference. Thank you. Honorable judges and justices, respected bar members, excellencies, dear members of the Asma Jahangir family, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am truly honored to be here in the amazing city of Lahore for centuries, a vibrant city center of culture. I was very much looking forward to visiting Pakistan, a beautiful country renowned for its warm hospitality and vitality. The last three years I served as the ambassador, the Dutch ambassador, to Qatar and got to know many members of the Pakistani community working in a variety of sectors there they always spoke with great affection about their home country, Pakistan. Pakistan is the first country that I pay a bilateral visit to in my newly assumed position as Dutch Human Rights Ambassador. So you can imagine your country will always have a special meaning to me. Thank you for this honor. I'm also I'm also very proud of the long-standing, friendly, and multifaceted relationship between our two countries. Thank you for having me here and giving me the opportunity to listen, interact, and learn from you. I'm also very proud, as you can see from the beautiful posters you made for this conference, that the Dutch Embassy to Pakistan is one of the supporters of this amazing Asma Jahangir conference. My first job at the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs was at the Human Rights Department. I dealt with the rights of women and girls and freedom of religion or belief. When I heard in those years about the fearless human rights defender Asma Jahangir, I was immediately moved by her amazing inner power, passion, perseverance, resilience, and wisdom. I, along with many across the world, remember Asma Jahangir as an inspirational human rights icon, an amazing woman. Asma strongly believed that, and I quote, 
Human rights is not a job, it is a conviction, unquote. This kept her going even when situations got tough and dangerous. In 2010, Asma was in my home country, the Netherlands, to receive the Freedom of Worship Medal from the Roosevelt Foundation. In her acceptance speech, she reminded us that democracy, rule of law, and human rights are closely interlinked. They flourish together or they perish together, one by one. Unfortunately, nowadays, this interlinkage seems to not be flourishing. It is disturbing to witness democratic backsliding, challenges to the rule of law, and a shrinking space for human rights defenders and media across the globe. The Netherlands strongly believes that we must work effectively together to stop this downward spiral. There should be no pause button for human rights, especially because human rights are also closely linked to sustainable development and security. We will not enjoy development without security, and we will not enjoy security without development. Without respect for human rights, neither is possible. A concept close to the heart of the Dutch is freedom. Over the coming year, we will be celebrating the 75th anniversary of our liberation from oppression during the Second World War. The Netherlands is deeply committed to human rights. We have a national action plan for human rights. Human rights play a central role in our Dutch foreign policy. And the Netherlands is... Excellencies, honorable justices, distinguished guests, Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. It's a privilege to join you on this auspicious occasion and allow me to express my appreciation to the ADHS Legal Aid Cell, the Asma Jahangir Foundation, and the Supreme Court Bar Association for organizing this conference. Also, many thanks to the sponsors that are making this possible. Khawatin Wazarat. Akwami Mataheda Me Asma Jahangir Ko Iyad Kia Jatahe Wo Insani Hakuk Ki Ek Bali Alam Baradati Us Bahadur Bahimat Akatun Ne Har insan kelia, har sata par avas otai. In 1996, as a journalist for the Norwegian newspaper Aftenposten, my wife interviewed Asma. She spoke with genuine pain when they discussed the plight of abused women or prisoners. Wasn't it hard to dedicate her life to fighting for them? No. Although, for her children's sake, she wished she did not always have to spend so much time away from home. One day, she said, they will hopefully understand why it was necessary. We know they have understood. We all understand. That's why we are here at this conference today with Asma's children as our hosts. Defending human rights has never been more necessary. Pakistan has made progress, but there is still much to do. Human rights are enshrined in the Constitution. Punjab's Human Rights Policy and the Transgender Persons Act are impressive strides. Pakistan has ratified major international human rights treaties. As part of the Human Rights Council, Pakistan has pledged to cooperate with the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the Special Procedures, a system of which ASMA was a leading member. We commend Pakistan's strong commitments. Yet, challenges remain. Millions of children are out of school. Maternal and infant mortality rates are high. Malnutrition is rampant. Women, minorities and activists face violence and discrimination. There are concerns that laws may be misused to target dissent. Extremist groups threaten freedom of expression with intimidation and attacks. More must be done to uphold human rights and to translate promises on paper into change on the ground. I cannot speak on human rights today without speaking of Kashmir. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres 
has clearly expressed the United Nations deep concern about the current situation. Allow me also to quote the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, who says, uh, I urge the governments of India and Pakistan to ensure that human rights are respected and protected. And it is important that the people of Kashmir are consulted and engaged in any decision-making pro processes that have an impact on their future. Last June, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights released, re released its report on human rights in Kashmir. It focuses on Indian administered Kashmir, the deaths, arrests, and serious barriers to civil liberties. It also notes challenges in Pakistan administered Kashmir, restrictions of freedom of expression, representation, and peaceful assembly. It is vital to ensure that the needs and rights of all Kashmiri people are respected and protected. Like the previous speaker, I would like to recall the words of former Secretary General Kofi Annan. We will not enjoy development without security, we will not enjoy security without development, and we will not enjoy either without respect for human rights. His words speak to the heart of the United Nations. 74 years ago, the UN Charter established the three pillars of the UN system, peace and security, development, and human rights. These pillars guide the UN's work in Pakistan. They guide the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Pakistan was one of the first countries to embrace the 2030 Agenda and its Sustainable Development Goals. It committed to leave no one behind and to reach those farthest behind first. Pakistan can only achieve these commitments by prioritizing human rights. Across Pakistan, the UN is working to advance the Sustainable Development Goals with partners at all levels, the society. I believe Pakistan is a confident nation. To carry out the government's development programs, authorities need civil society support. To provide this support, civil society needs government to create... Friends, brothers and sisters in the law, it's wonderful to be here. And it's especially wonderful uh, that we're celebrating the life and the legacy of my good friend Asma Jahangir. Asma would regularly come to Britain and she and I would meet and we would chew the fat and talk about the importance of the rule of law in our world and the importance of the pursuit of peace and justice everywhere and we knew together as we conspired that fundamental to that was law that law good law was vitally important. I wrote a book which I have updated at different times since but I wrote it 30 years ago about the position of women in the legal system in Britain but it really could have been read in most parts of the world because it was about the ways in which the exclusion of women from the creation of law because law essentially was made by the men in our societies because of the nature of women's position historically. Because of that, the nature of law was that it very often failed to deliver justice for women. And I called the book Eve Was Framed. And this tickled Asma Jahangir greatly. She loved the idea that it was, of course, women who were at the beginning of all this business of blaming that it was a woman who persuaded Adam to be disobedient and to disobey the Almighty. And uh, that was why my book was called Eve Was Framed. It was about the way in which we have to change law, black letter law, but also the way in which law is delivered and we have to introduce into legal systems a recognition of the failure to have enough women involved a recognition of the different lives that women have, the reality of women's lives, and that we needed to do this to deliver justice. And it's why having women in the law, having women on the bench at the most senior levels, all through the system, and in our education systems, teaching law, commenting on law, and women in our uh, media to comment on law's failures and the way in which law can be improved, telling the stories of injustice, it's so important that our world is equal and fair. I regularly speak to young audiences and it reminds me regularly, as indeed it does to me now as a grandmother, when you speak to young children about how visceral 
the idea of fairness is, how we all learn at a very early stage when something is unfair. And so from the earliest of times in our human uh, uh, development, we know what injustice looks like. From the earliest times in our human history, societies and communities have created laws to try to harmonize our societies. And of course, those rules tr are translated into the legal systems which are now operating around the world. The rule of law, as you know, is a foundational pillar of a stable and just society. The rule of law internationally is fundamental to peace and justice in a conflicted world. And so we must always recognize that we, as lawyers and judges, are operating at the most fundamental levels within our society. And we therefore have to see our role as being something in which we take pride, but something which we deliver without fear or favor. In Britain, of course, we always like to imagine that we invented the rule of law. I think that we perhaps aggrandize our role in that. But it is true that in the 13th century, Magna Carta, the charter, the great charter was created, and its purpose was to reign in the power of the king. It was to say that even the king was not above law. And the message that that gave to, certainly to the England of the 13th century, was that there was no impunity, even for the king. That has translated now, worldwide, into the idea that no one with power is above Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Honorable Mr. Justice Gulzar Ahmad, the Senior Puny Judge of the Supreme Court of Pakistan, my learned colleagues, panelists, various office bearers of the Bar Council and Bar Associations, Mr. Abed Hassan Manto, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum. We are gathered here to commemorate the memory of Asma Jhangi. She was a petite woman, but through her deeds, she walked all among the best of the best as a person, a lawyer, human rights activist to mankind and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small, and to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained and to promote social progress and better standards of life and larger freedom." Unquote. The founding of the UN was followed by the United Nations taking several steps and measures for the preservation of human rights. The United Nations General Assembly at its third session held on December 10, 1948 adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at Paris. France. It may be emphasized that it was primarily due to the efforts of a woman, namely Eleanor Roosevelt, the widow of President Franklin Roosevelt, who acted as the chairperson of the committee which drafted the declaration. I feel no hesitation in saying that women have been at the forefront of championing the cause of human rights, and in Pakistan our champion is Asma Jahangir. I further feel no hesitation in saying that the champion of human rights today is again a young girl of 16 years from Sweden, whom we know as Greta Thunberg. In August 2018, whilst recognizing the ill effects of global warming and the consequent climate change, she organized a school strike for making the leaders and nations of the world take images, notice and badly needed steps for stronger action on global warming and climate change. In a famous How Dare You speech delivered last month during the latest session of the General Assembly, she took to task those nations who maintained that there is no such thing as climate change 
the chief among them being the United States of America. As we all know, global warming and climate change is a reality and Pakistan is one of the countries predicted to be worst hit by the drastic change in the world's climate. Now some of you might wonder, what is the nexus between climate change and human rights? According to the United Nations Environmental Programme's report on climate change and human rights, climate change is one of the greatest threats to human rights in our, of our generation. It poses a serious risk to the fundamental rights to life, health, food and an adequate standard of living of individuals and communities across the world. To this end, not only the UN but intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations Human rights and environmental advocates and academics are working together to chart a way forward so that human rights of the various inhabitants of the world which are likely to be adversely affected by climate change are adequately protected by taking measures to reverse global warming and the consequent climate change. The field of international human rights law has traditionally been, been linked with the rights of the individual and primarily with civil and political rights and liberties. When the topic of human rights law is brought up, the usual image conjured up is that of the political prisoner or victim of discrimination. Although there is still much work to be done in the area of preserving civil and political rights, in recent years a more holistic approach to rights and civil liberties has developed that extends beyond negative obligations on the state, preventing executive that would unjustly encroach on the liberty or dignity and fundamental freedoms of ordinary citizens. In today's world, human rights now extend to wider concepts that would affect the community, that would, that would affect the community as a whole and which can at times be perceived as curtailing the freedoms of persons or groups to engage in specific activi activities in public interest. Chief among these is the concept that the need to protect the environment is not only a goal to be achieved in itself, but rather an idea that touches on many areas of human rights and human development and is interlinked with many areas of human rights such as those relating to the rights of women, the rights of children, social and economic rights and importantly the right to life itself. The idea that there is a strong link between human rights and the environment is a well-established principle of Pakistani jurisprudence. Starting with the landmark judgment of Shala Zia versus Federation of Pakistan, where the Honorable Supreme Court laid down the principle that the right to life, otherwise than in due course of law, comprises not only the right not to be uh, sorry that the, the right to life comprises not only the right to be to not to be deprived of life, otherwise than in due course of law, but also the right to a good quality of life. This concept was extended to the idea of maintaining a clean and healthy environment. There is also an increased urgency in these matters with the effect of climate change becoming more apparent. The link between protection of human rights and environmentalism is now self-evident. The United Nations Environment Program and the Human Rights Council have both published a great deal of literature and instituted key policies in this regard. In its 2015 report on the impact of climate change on human rights, the UNEP lays out some of the ways in which a focus on climate change is not necessary in human rights law. To the effects of climate change, both inland and coastal ecosystems are now under threat. Changing weather patterns are now affecting crop yields and limiting access to clean and fresh drinking water. Erosion of coastlines also poses a risk to many cities and smaller communities which rely on fisheries for subsistence. Both the economic efforts of climate change, effects of climate change and potential population displacement will pose several challenges to the protection of human rights. This will, this will especially be in the case in developing nations which rely in large part on agriculture as a source of employment and revenue. It is important to note here that according to several international human rights bodies, including the various constituent bodies of the UN such as the UNEP and the Office of the High Commissioner for Refugees, 
women rights and the rights of the girl child are especially relevant to environment as a human right in order for programs promoting the protection of the environment to be successful as well as to mitigate the effects of climate change it is important to continue to support and empower women particularly in rural communities in the developing world many social structures in the developing world put women and girls at a disproportionate risk of adverse effects due to climate change a lack of access to education and ability to enforce rights related to ownership of property and involvement in community decisions leads many women in a position where they are unable to participate in the dialogue around climate change and the environment while being exposed to its ill effects yeah, it is hence that even from the point of view of the human right to to a clean environment and to prevent climate change and combat its ill effects that the work carried out by the late asma jangir and those who continue her legacy takes on greater significance not only because of its merits in itself but also in ensuring a right that is existential in nature and touches on all areas of human rights is in force there are those who deny the importance of human rights and of environmental protection both in our country and the world in general however these persons are often disingenuous in their arguments and often simply protecting their own commercial and financial in interests such persons seek to take advantage of ignorance and act malafide to undermine the welfare of the public to achieve their own ends here it is the role of practitioners of human rights law and environmental protection to ensure these rights and fundamental freedoms are protected it is important to note that greta thunberg speech before the general assembly she stated that it is not the responsibility of young people to provide hope when their elders have done nothing to mitigate looming environmental catastrophe she quite rightly makes clear that it is not promises about the future but action by those in authority that is needed to safeguard these fundamental rights it is we who have the responsibility to take action greta thunberg serves as an example of the fact that we must endeavor to make environmental protection a greater priority in the context of the protection of human rights while also working to empower women and girls in our country so that they may also have a greater say in matters relating to their own rights as well as being able to participate in and contribute to solving issues which affect our community just as the asma jhangi foundation has done for so many years moving away from i have been asked to um, run through my speech okay i'll curtail it thank you um uh, i would just briefly say that the united nations besides working on the environment has also worked on the laws of war and also the right of self determination but sadly the right of self determination in vis-a-vis -vis the palestinians and the kashmiris is still remains a dream the un needs to to say the least pull its pull up its socks in these matters now moving on to the domestic front i would like to say that for protection of human rights in pakistan various entities have performed their role first and foremost among them being asma jangir and our colleagues at the pakistan commission of human rights under the constitution the high courts and supreme courts of uh, supreme court of pakistan are empowered under articles 199 and article 1843 respectively to ensure that fundamental rights guaranteed by the constitution are adequately protected i am proud to say that our courts have continuously endeavored to uphold the dignity of man and to make sure that the human rights of citizens and other persons in pakistan are well protected i have briefly alluded to the shala zayas case moving from there there have been several landmark decisions of the honorable supreme court on the protection of environment our honorable senior pvini judge of the supreme court has been in the for in the forefront in trying to improve the environment in karachi the encroachment in karachi and the water shortage in karachi his efforts are laudable and he he deserves a special mention in this respect sim 
coming to the Lahore High Court, we have, I am proud to say that with the cooperation of the Asian Development Bank, we have trained trial judges to try cases involving victims of gender-based violence. Special courts have been set up and the judges have been also given special training. We are again proud to say that the, in, the, in Lahore, the first ever gender-based violence court was set up. It was the first ever court in Asia. Now, the Chief Justice of Pakistan, uh, under his guidance I, through the National Judicial Policy Making Committee, a decision was made to train judges from all over Pakistan to try cases involving gender-based violence. And I'm happy to say that the Punjab Judicial Academy has trained judges from all over Pakistan so that courts trying the gender-based violence crimes become functional in each district and province of Pakistan. As I've been asked to curtail my speech, I'm afraid I'm going to cut quite a few paragraphs from it. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Sarah. Well, uh, the members of the bar, the office bearers, senior office bearers of the bar council and the bar associations, of uh, Pakistan as well as uh, other areas of Pakistan. My colleagues, judges of the High Court and uh, the Honorable Distinguished uh, Foreign Dignitaries, I welcome them and also say my salam to them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are here for uh, holding in the Asma Jangir conference with a agenda of roadmap for human rights. Asma Jangir, she has been a great person and uh, a great very known legal personality of Pakistan where she has been known as an activist for enforcement of uh, democratic institutions, for uh, enforcement and ensuring the protection of the constitution, independence of judiciary, as well as for enforcement of fundamental rights for which she has always been fighting and taking up the cause with all level of the society, government, courts, everywhere. She has been a bulwark on the side and uh, I believe that uh, her uh, efforts and work done in this regard will always be remembered and further be pursued by other such activists as such activists are required by this country at all times. The AGS uh, law firm has been established and uh, such uh, activism of her perhaps is continuing and will continue and uh, our effort for bringing justice to the people of rather lesser uh, downtrodden people will be carried forward by their by our firm of law so also our friends colleagues who have been in partner with her in doing this work. Well, lot of things have been said about her by the earlier speakers and uh, I really think that uh, the woman, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Madam Asma Jangir's personality, work and every aspect of her life has been uh, given, has been lighted upon and expressed upon and her legacy, I hope that people are able to carry on and work on and uh, 
she as a successful lady has proved herself she has been a president of the supreme court bar association she has been a chairman of the pakistan human rights association she has hold, held so many offices here in pakistan women action forum she has got uh, education ed- she has obtained doctorate de- honorary, honorary doctorate degrees for so many large large number of universities and uh, this is not something which could be conferred upon an ordinary person but a person like asma jahangir who really deserve all this thing she has been really a great person for pakistan for the pakistanis for the poor pakistanis also and i believe her legacy will be carried on and uh, further work on her work shall be carried on thank you do not think the authorities were legally within their right to treat mr butler in this manner and the authorities must be aware of the adverse implications of denying him entry we cannot but disapprove of this procedure in the strongest terms possible asma jahangir conference committee believes that journalists must be allowed freedom to move to other countries in the world and meet fellow journalists and report on the state of freedom of expression anywhere denial of this right to any journalist will not go down to the credit of the state of pakistan We have amongst us a senior journalist Mariana Babar and she suggested that in solidarity with Steven Butler and with CPJ and with the journalists around the world and in solidarity with all those who have struggled for freedom of expression we stand up just for a minute to show our support Whoever is sending it, please help me to understand. You are not communicating clearly, and in my case, it certainly will not silence me. Uh, will it change what I say about Pakistan and press freedom? I don't think so. I also want to say that this this is not primarily a story about me personally. I'm not an important person in this drama. Much more important is what it says about freedom of expression and freedom of the press in Pakistan, both of which. are guaranteed in Pakistan's constitution. I was looking forward very much to being with all of you this weekend. I visited Pakistan quite a few times in recent years. I've enjoyed my visits and grown fond of the place and the people. I have many friends who I will not be able to see at least not for now. And for me, this has become deeply personal. Of course, I believe in and support the idea of press freedom. Press freedom is an essential underpinning to democracy everywhere. But I have also come to admire deeply the talent, integrity, and bravery of many Pakistani journalists who I have come to know and whose friendship I value. They are implying that who is responsible for the censorship imposed on Pakistani media. So the chairman of uh, that committee he asked a very simple question have you ever issued any notification or instructions for banning the coverage of molana fazlur rahman they said no sir then the the chairman who is a senator he said are you sure you are denying it in the senate of pakistan you are denying it that you are not responsible for imposing any censorship you are saying that you have not sent any message that's what you said he said yes sir then the chairman of the committee senator mustafa nawaz tokar he said are you sure are you sure what you are saying that this is not a misconduct what you are saying please read the section 7 of the pemra ordinance that is about the misconduct of the chairman pemra and the other members so he read uh, that article he said that if i claim that i have the evidence that you people have issued written instructions 
through WhatsApp. Then what will you do? The Pembro official said, I am sorry, sir. So, I want to say that those who have censorship in Pakistan, they are so angry that when they ask them in the Senate, do you have to say censorship? They say they are angry with their eyes. No, sir. Then when they say that they are still there, that you have to put censorship in censorship, उनकी गर्दन भी झुक जाती है वो कहते हैं सॉरी सर अब आप अंदाजा लगाएं कि दिस इज द्यूज एम्बेसमेंट ऑफ द स्टेट ऑफ पाकिस्तान विच क्लेम दैट वी आर अ न्यूक्लियर पावर दे डोंट हैव द मॉरल करेज टू एक्सेप्ट दैट यस वी हैव इंपोज सेंसरशिप तो वो पाकिस्तान के इदारे जिन्होंने सेंसरशिप लगाई है انہوں نے اس ریاست کی نظریں بھی جھکا دی ہیں اس ریاست کی گردن بھی جھکا دی ہے ان میں اتنی اخلاقی جرت نہیں ہے کہ وہ مانے کہ ہاں ہم نے سینسرشپ لگائی ہے تو یہ کہاں یہ کہاں کی حبل وطنی ہے یہ کہاں کی پیٹریوٹیزم ہے پہلے جب انہوں نے آصف زرداری صاحب پر پابندی لگائی تو ہم نے کہا یہ آپ نے پابندی کیوں لگائی ہے دے سیٹ We cannot allow the coverage of Asif Ali Zardari because he is under trial. Then they put Mariam Nawaz on the ground. We asked why we put it on the ground. They said, we cannot allow the coverage of Mariam Nawaz because she is convicted. Now Maulana Fazul Rahman on the ground. So now they say that we have no explanation. Just don't do the coverage of her coverage. That is a एक रियासत के लिए थ्रेट है तो मैं कहना यह चाहता हूं कि ऑल दोज पीपल हु आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर द एम्बेसमेंट ऑफ द स्टेट ऑफ पाकिस्तान जो स्टीवन बटलर के साथ किया जो स्टीवन बटलर के साथ किया जिसने भी उसको पाकिस्तान से एक्सपेल किया है जिसने ये ऑर्डर किया है वो पाकिस्तान का दोस्त नहीं वो पाकिस्तान का दुश्मन है ही इज एनिमी ऑफ पाकिस्तान because he embarrassed the state of Pakistan all over the world. Now, what happened? He came from Skype and he talked to Skype. Did he talk to him? Did he talk to him? Did he talk to him? I am doing more of the whole thing. He talked to him. He didn't talk to him. So, I just want to say that the fact is that the word of WordPress Freedom Index is also going down to the press freedom in Pakistan. Press freedom is going down to the press. हर जगह पे पाकिस्तान नीचे जा रहा है और अगर आप स्टीवन बटलर को यहां पे आने देते तो शायद वो को अच्छी बातें करता लेकिन आपने स्टीवन बटलर को एक्सपेल कर दिया तो इससे साबित हो गया कि जिन लोगों ने मौलाना फजल रहमान पर पाबंदी लगाई है उन्होंने स्टीवन बटलर को एक्सपेल किया है एंड ऑल दीज पीपल दे आर दिस इज यू मे डिस एग्री विद मी दे आर एनिमीज ऑफ पाकिस्तान दे आर एनिमीज ऑफ पाकिस्तान They are violating the constitution of Pakistan because they are violating Article 19. This is a very Pakistan that is a very good thing. This is a very good thing. This is a very good thing. And we have to say that the Moody Kashmir media is a censorship. It is a very good thing. So, you have to say that the Moody is a very good thing. Pakistani media is a very good thing. You have to say that the Moody is a very good thing. سیون پٹلر پر پابندی لگائی ہے میں زیادہ لمبی بات نہیں کرتا میں صرف یہ کہوں گا کہ سوری ٹو سے جس ملک کی عدلیہ آزاد نہ ہو جس ملک کی پارلیمنٹ آزاد نہ ہو اس ملک کا میڈیا بھی آزاد نہیں ہو سکتا عدلیہ کا جو بھی جج تھوڑی سی آزادی اظہار کی حمایت میں سامنے آتا ہے آپ اس کو بھی عبرت کا نمونہ بنانے کی کوشش کرتے ہیں جو سیاستان تھوڑا سچ بول دے اس کو بھی آپ عبرت کا نمونہ بنانے کی کوشش کرتے ہیں جو صحافی یہ کرتا ہے اس کو بھی آپ عبرت کا نمونہ بنانے کی کوشش کرتے ہیں لیکن آپ جیسے لوگوں کے لیے حبیب جالب نے ایک بات کہی تھی جب حبیب جالب صاحب کی ایک کتاب پر پابندی لگائی گئی تو انہوں نے ایک بات کہی تھی میرے ہاتھ میں کلم ہے میرے ذہن میں اجالا مجھے کیا دبا سکے گا کوئی ظلمتوں کا پالا مجھے فکر امن عالم تجھے اپنی ذات کا غم میں تلو ہونے والا 
तू गरूब होने वाला तू गरूब होने वाला बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया हामिद जी साहब Well first of all before uh, anything I'd like to say I'm really glad to be here for Asma Jangi's conference and when the organizers reached out to me um I usually don't do these things but I left immediately because it's impossible to say no and she's really missed in this country uh, I think particularly at this moment in Pakistan her courage her tenacity her willingness to actually speak truth to power in ways that nobody else really has since and I I don't know did before And so I'm just going to say thank you to Asma. Um about your question, I mean it's it's very straightforward. Um we we did a couple of stories. The person who gave me the interview was the subject of the first story. He's perfectly fine with it. Um there was an institution that he believed was um uh, either facilitating or making possible certain policies of the state security policies that he objected to. and um that is what got him in trouble i think that's what got don in trouble that's what got me in trouble but um i would like to say picking up on hamid's point about the judiciary and with apologies to uh justice sisa sitting in front of me um he's a noble exception but i think part of what we're seeing in the media today in pakistan the crackdown has become possible because the judiciary has facilitated it or been complicit in it And I'll give you my own example. This is the first time I've come to Lahore in 10 months. The last time I was here was for a treason hearing, where two of the three judges of the bench, which issued an arrest warrant for me, put me on the ECL and dragged me to the court. Two of the judges themselves didn't turn up at this stupendously important hearing five months after the event first broke. So I think you've seen this time and again that. the judiciary if you're talking about media freedoms if you're talking about fundamental rights it is the courts that have to protect the people and enforce their fundamental rights uh i don't expect to be hauled before a court to answer treason allegations for an on the record interview they have conducted with the prime minister of pakistan but here we have three judges of the law germany economic progress i think there is a fundamental flaw in that it's worthwhile remembering that today Uh, Bangladesh has the fastest growing rate of wealthy people in the world and that the inequality between the poor and the rich has increased substantially over this period of time if you look at the people who've actually generated growth in Bangladesh the garment workers the migrant workers the farmers in the field their situation is no better today than it was whereas in the last 11 years something like 83.7 billion dollars have been sent overseas so i think that definition itself needs to be questioned but i'll come back to this situation that's happening here because i i think uh you know i'm here now uh had i applied for a journalist visa i wouldn't have been given one i came on a conference visa uh this is happening in pakistan last month i was meant to be speaking in india i was refused a visa And of course I did what Stephen did. By the way, Steve is he is not there yet. Is he still listening? I was looking forward to meeting up with an old friend, but yes, uh, I'm listening. Uh, hi Steve. But the point is, um at the end of the day Steve is still here. He's talking to us. I was still participating in India through the same means. And it's pretty stupid of these governments to think that they can actually stop us in this manner. All they do is shoot themselves in the foot. But it it goes to show how idiotic these regimes are really and and that at the end of the day someone needs to tell them look come on get out of this grow up um but I'll come back to the issues at hand i mean we look at across the subcontinent and i think the similarities are are pretty staggering the fact that none of these countries um uh, have any respect for human rights or democracy yet all of them espouse democracy and human rights in their rhetoric so the gap between the rhetoric and the practice i think is uh pretty phenomenal but i also 